Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, final panel of the day, I think. Um, it's a very exciting one. We have Funding the State, New Approaches to the National Debt. Um, so I'm Craig McGlashan from Global Capital, and I think I'll just let the uh, panelists introduce themselves if we can start on the right there. Barry, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets at the U.S. Treasury Department. So I'm responsible, among other things, for our debt management policy and issuance decisions made in U.S. Treasury debt. I'm Cristina Casalinho. I'm the head of the Portuguese uh, Debt Management uh, Agency. I'm Pablo de Ramon Laca. I'm uh, head of funding and debt management at the Spanish Treasury. My name is Tamo Dima, Federal Republic of Germany Finance Agency. Martin Egan, Vice Chairman, BP Paribas. Uh, Davide Iacovoni, Head of uh, Public Debt Directorate at the Department of the Treasury and Ministry of Finance in Italy. Brilliant. So, um, it's, it's sort of think the experience this year in, in markets, um, the start of the year, fairly benign. Um, and then there was uh, some, shall we say, bouts of turbulence uh, later on. Um, so I think maybe we could just start off. I am asking the, the issuers, you know, what's what's been their experience so far this year in, in terms of funding conditions, and maybe we start with David. Yes, I think we were a little bit of uh, the epicenter of what happened uh, uh, starting from mid-May. Um, we have been experiencing pretty healthy market uh, uh, this year. Um, even going through the um, election uh, deadline in the uh, beginning of March, the market was pretty resilient and even after the elections, despite the results of the elections, there were uh, several parties without clear majority in parliament, uh, the market continued to perform pretty, pretty well. Um, uh, the problem, I think, came out when it was clear that uh, forming a government was not easy and uh, it, it, the, 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 the positions of parties were pretty different. So, and trying to form a coalition uh, was not an easy job. And these, uh, maybe after a while, was uh, all of a sudden priced uh, by the market. And so we have seen a pretty large turbulence, also looking at the amount, uh, the, let's say, the size of movements in the unit of time and that we experienced it, they were even larger than what we experienced it in 2000 at the crisis, at the peak of the crisis at the end of 2011. Um, but in terms of our funding, we've been pretty uh, regular despite these market conditions. Uh, we probably lighten up a little bit the pressure on the short end part of the curve, taking into account what was going on in the market. Uh, but um, by, by the end of May, beginning of June, we have already completed uh, more than 55% of our funding uh, uh, for this year. And of course, uh, now the market seems a little bit more stable, we'll uh, uh, keep on with our targets of um, uh, trying to consolidate the results in terms of average life of our debt and uh, keep on uh, providing liquidity of, uh, to all uh, our, our debt lines. Yeah, we have not seen we have not seen a, a similar pattern. In fact, I must say we had uh, good auctions and not so good auctions throughout the year. Although I must say that in the secondary market we had very good conditions, and our observation is that the turnover in German government bonds since the fourth quarter of 2016 has stabilized and slightly increased since then. As you know, it's a global phenomenon. Turnover in government bond markets uh, is, is decreasing over the last 10 years, but there has been this stabilization, and we took advantage of this since many of you know that we are not only issuing in the primary market, but we are also selling our bonds in the secondary market. The results there were very stable in the primary market throughout the year, goods and not so good results. We've, um, so far this year, it's, it's been dominated by the rating improvements uh, for the Kingdom of Spain. Um, this is, this is the, the recognition of the fundamental improvement in the Spanish economy uh, that's come relatively late, but just in time. Uh, for tapering and, and for, uh, for, for the new phase that we are um, stepping into. 
So there's been, out of the rates component, the rates component might have increased, but the credit component has compressed so much so that we have actually reduced our 10-year absolute yield with respect to the end of last year. Uh, at the same time, this produces the rating increase, uh, the, the rating improvement produce uh, a, a deepening and a widening of our investor base, which is very exciting for us to, to see, uh, especially as our own central bank is expected to bow out of this market towards the end of this year. Uh, so this is what's dominated despite and throughout the bouts of volatility that, that Spain has, has suffered along with its, uh, uh, along with its peers. Uh, but it's a tribute to how far we have come uh, with the European reforms um, that, uh, that, that Spain can have a change of government, as we've had in the past two, three years, uh, two, three weeks, sorry, um, without that affecting the capital markets too much, uh, insofar as that isn't expected to change um, the, the political economy and the fundamental improvement of Spain. Uh, so, so we're, we're quite optimistic about this. Um, but yes, this, is, this has been what's, uh, what's characterized the Spanish debt market for the past five months. Uh, so, uh, in Portugal, with, uh, with the last auction that we held uh, this month, we have completed 81% of our funding plan. So, uh, and actually, we're already pre-financing for next year. Uh, we saw our 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 yields uh, uh, going down quite substantially through this year, and at the same time, and this was actually driven by compression in uh, in the credits uh, spread. We also benefited, as, as uh, to some extent, as uh, Paul was mentioning uh, in regard of Spain. We also benefited from a, a, a series of upgrades happening last year. So Portugal was upgraded to investment grade by both uh, Fitch and, um, and S&P, and also have an improvement in the outlook by, by Moody's. Um, this has allowed us to uh, have face uh, record low uh, yields, and, and these allowed us to term out our debt. Uh, now we are able to print a new 15-year benchmark uh, at, the, at a rate that actually coincides more or less with, uh, with the, the overall cost of our debt stock. Currently, we have uh, an average weighted, uh, weighted average maturity of eight years, which is considerably long for, uh, in terms of European standards. And, and so far, uh, we have been facing a very, uh, a very solid and constructive backdrop. We have been able to, uh, to uh, broaden our investor base, uh, not only on the back of, uh, of the upgrades, but also uh, on the back of uh, the very solid fundamentals that we have been witnessing. Portugal has been growing at a very fast uh, rate these days. Last year, we grew at 2.7%, uh, which is something that we have not witnessed in, uh, in the past decade. And, and now Portugal also enjoys an employment rate uh, at, of 7.4%, uh, which is uh, uh, below pre-crisis levels. And that we are now running also a, a, primary, a primary surplus that has allowed our that, uh, stock, public debt stock, to, uh, to start uh, um, a downward trajectory. So now we have, uh, we have entered uh, a, quite, uh, a quite interesting um, decline in terms of uh, the declining trend in terms of the, the public debt stock, which actually has been combined with also very significant deleveraging happening uh, at the private sector. Um, in the United States, obviously, a slightly different situation uh, than uh, what some of the other European governments were experiencing this year. But just a couple of points to make. Obviously, the Federal Reserve has already started to tighten rates in the United States. Um, and as part of their process of, uh, uh, of ending QE, they are starting to shrink the size of their portfolio, uh, which means they are reinvesting fewer treasuries as they mature out of their portfolio, which means we are picking up from the U.S. Treasury side, picking up uh, issuance on the marketable side to make up that difference in the amount that the Federal Reserve is not reinvesting. So we are looking at a rising rate environment in the United States. We are looking at increased uh, issuance needs both to cover uh, the Fed's SOMA portfolio roll-off, but also uh, some increased uh, deficits in the United States. But the, the point to make for us is that uh, we are such a large issuer 
Uh, just for a scope of size, secondary market trading on average is about 500 billion daily in the U.S. Treasury market. Um, that uh, we simply need to issue through all interest rate environments. So whether the yield curve is flattening as it is now, whether the Fed is raising rates or not, um, you know, we have a financing need and we, we look at it as uh, trying to um, issue uh, at the lowest cost to the U.S. taxpayer over time. Uh, and we're big enough that we kind of, our mantra is regular and predictable. So uh, we like to message what we do before we do it so the market knows it's coming. Um, and also, we're very predictable in that uh, we continue to, to issue across the curve kind of in any interest rate, uh, in any interest rate scenario, market, markets are volatile or not. I just, um, you, you mentioned the, this is a fairly flat uh, curve there, and I know there's been talk about whether this is a, a sign of recession and so on. I mean, is, is the economic outlook in the U.S. still, is still pretty strong, is it still pretty confident? Or? Um, it's very robust at the moment. Um, uh, you know, the administration is, is forecasting close to 3% growth uh, this year. Um, and I know private sector forecasts are somewhere in the 25 to 2.8% range, uh, which is very healthy, strong growth. Obviously, there has been fiscal stimulus in the United States recently with the tax cut that was passed back in December. I know there's some mm -hmm. uncertainty very much in terms of how that all plays out, whether there's things like repatriation, and uh, how corporations um, will put to use uh, potential kind of extra cash that they may have. Uh, but overall, it's a very strong picture right now in the United States, um, uh, and uh, definitely for, for the next year or two. Excellent. And, and Christina, you, you sort of talked a little bit about the, the outlook for, for Portugal. Um, just for the other panelists, I mean, everyone's still confident in, in how their economies are growing, um, Tamil? <laughs> economy is growing on a broad basis in the euro area. This is very supportive. Uh, unemployment rates go down on, on, in, 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 in all the countries. Even Greece has grown, has shown growth in 2017. This is, all of these numbers are slightly weakening in 2018, as, as you all know. Um, but still, there is a lot of support and uh, in our case also a lot of tax income, if I may say that. And the um, result is, uh, is very benign, yes. If I may add, from an Italian perspective, we were able to catch up very well, I have to say, uh, the recovery in all throughout Europe. So we grew our growth in uh, real growth in real terms in 2017 was 1.5%, which is slightly below the European Euro average, but was uh, uh, remarkably higher if compared with the average of the three years before. Uh, we projecting the same growth this year, probably looking at the recent data, as Tom was saying, the, we may expect something a little bit lower than 1.5%. But this, nonetheless, has allowed us to uh, keep the, the, to stabilize uh, the depth of a GDP ratio right now. And uh, in, in 2017, we had the first small reduction. And so we are heading towards the same path even uh, for the next year. On the other positive news for the Italian economy is on the labor market, because we are now still a high unemployment rate, but well below the, 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 the level that we reached during the peak of the crisis. So we are now in the region of 11%. And what is also striking is the fact we had also a very strong increase in participation rate, which is an encouraging uh, sign that the, the underlying condition in the labor market are improving. So now we have a participation rate which is the highest since the last 10 years. Excellent. Martin, I just wondered if BNP Paribas the house view and, and Eurozone growth? Yeah, generally, we're currently fairly positive on global growth, um, to be fair, mostly um, led by the US. And as you've heard, in, I think in the vast majority of European jurisdictions, um, the numbers are in a positive trend. Um, however, it's clear now that there are some concerns that, you know, there'll be some more negativity ahead. Um, perhaps, I don't know sure what Clay would think, but in the US going into 2020, perhaps later this year, um, in the Eurozone, obviously watching Asia and emerging markets very closely. Um, but we are currently, in terms of, of market dynamics and economic dynamics, in, in a pretty good place. Um, but I wonder if there's more challenge on, on the downside to come. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and um, Christina, you sort of talked a little bit about the economy before. Uh, uh, just, just to add something, uh, I think that uh, the sort of robustness that uh, uh, robustness in growth that Portugal is experiencing these days, uh, we should acknowledge the fact that part of it uh, results from the structural reforms that were adopted, not only at the time of the program, but even before that. Only now we're reaping the benefits of that. So you are, what we're witnessing these days is that uh, the sort of uh, growth model that we have and uh, the growth engines that we have, have have changed a bit. They are much less reliant on, on domestic demand only. And you have now uh, exports providing a good anchor for growth. Um, the, the level of uh, competitiveness of the Portuguese industries these days has, has increased quite significantly. And, and this is something that actually started uh, almost 20 years ago, and only now we have it. Has, it, has, it, it, uh, it now is bec has become apparent uh, that a lot of uh, restructuring, revamping of these uh, industries, a lot of turnarounds have been happening in, in an, a, a set of uh, a set of industries, and only now we, we can see uh, how uh, how they are contributing. For, for potential growth that now have, has moved into, into a, a different level, a definitely upper level than, than, than before. And the, the Portuguese economy is now much more flexible. The level of openness is, has increased substantially. And, uh, and even in more traditional sectors, things have, have, have changed um, completely. Some similar story for Spain. Yeah, similar story. I mean, bottom line is Spain's, um, Spain's national debt is now high. Uh, private sector, as usual, of course, it, it was high before, but now public sector as well. And all of that adds up to a negative net international investment position. And so our, our mission as, as, a, as a macro economy is to delever that. Uh, and that can only be achieved uh, through growth with a current account surplus. This is what we've been achieving for the past five years. And this is uh, unseen in Spain's recent history, which shows that the, our, our, our growth model is different. So as long as we can continue to grow with the current account surplus, uh, the markets will see us mm. benignly. Uh, and if we do anything that stops growth or stops the current um, account surplus from continuing, um, we could get into trouble. And that's, it, it's very clear the way we have to go. And this is why I, I insist we can have a change of government, but that doesn't change that fundamental truth, uh, which all governments have to see. So it's unlikely to, to, to change direction. There is actually a very good page in the Spanish investor um, presentation on that particular story. I like it a lot, where, the, where Spain took actually the path from, from a growing but uh, net, uh, um, net, net, net balanced uh, economy to a now a surplus con economy which is also growing. I like this page so much that I took it in our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our, our, big, our biggest vulnerability is, is, is uh, um, we have a, a structural deficit in royalties and intellectual property, uh, which is... Uh, Excellent. So, <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so, I mean, that sort of ties in nicely to the the next question. Um, obviously, we've seen some um, uh, I put political wrangling um, here, but um, sort of you know, political risk has obviously reared its head uh, this year in Italy. Um, you mentioned the change of government in Spain. Even um, Mrs. Merkel not looking too solid at the minute in Germany. Um, but is the sort of is the situation now that because of all these reforms and um, all the different work that's going on, the, the sort of contagions no longer, uh, no longer a risk. Um, maybe start with you, Christina, on that one. Well, um, I, I really think the, the level of contagion that we are seeing currently is, uh, seems to be uh, uh, to have subsided uh, from the height of the crisis. Um, we, uh, Portugal, also had a, a new cabinet taking office in, uh, in late 2015. And through most of 2016, people were a bit uh, suspicious of the new uh, political configuration. And uh, everyone took a bit of time to understand how market or business friendly the, the, the government would be. Uh, and in the end, uh, I really think that 
This was a, a socialist-led government, which has uh, been in office for a, a number of times before, so it, then it was not that different from, from, from previous occasions. But uh, what I currently see is that the, level, the, the toolkit that uh, European institutions these days have to, uh, to address uh, crisis in Europe is much more, uh, it, it's wider. Uh, you have much more tools available, and more than that, they are much at ease with putting these tools to use. And they can be much quickly deployed than in the past. And I think the whole architecture of the European project is much more robust these days, and more flexibility has been built in. And, and I think that is also a reason why we, we see that contagion is not such a, a, a huge um, problem, or it's not something that comes up on the top of our minds when we see spurts of volatility as we saw uh, lately. Okay, so Martin, could I get, get your take on that sort of um, volatility, uh, uh, sorry, contagion, a uh, thing of the past? Well, I think it was one of the biggest concerns the markets had um, around um, the specific challenges in terms of uh, the Italian government and, and the disparate views at an early stage. And I think markets were very worried about contagion risk, but as it transpired, um, contagion risk was um, somewhat limited. I think it is the biggest concern in terms of, God forbid, another financial crisis, i.e. The, the size and scale of contagion risk in any specific event. Um, but after some very pronounced volatility, to be, to be frank, um, markets didn't really turn to normal, but they did actually stabilise in a reasonably short time frame. And if you look really back over the last 10 years um, post-financial crisis, we've had a very limited situations when we've seen true contagion risk. However, I think now we do have to watch markets very closely, um, specifically the different trajectory of rates globally, with obviously very clear, clearly higher rates in the US, Mr. Draghi confirming that uh, European rates will remain low for the time being. I think that the US rate outlook, especially for emerging markets, is really critical for overall market dynamics, and we've seen events in Brazil, we've seen events in Argentina, we've seen events in Turkey, etc. So undoubtedly there's a bit more um, volatility in play and some contagion risk in play, but perhaps that is more in the emerging market credits rather than the developed markets credits. But it's something we watch very closely. And I would say finally, I think the events we've seen in Italy is also a stark reminder that markets don't always trade um, in one direction. And I think we need to be very careful to make sure as, as an industry and as different borrowers, investors, banks in the market, we watch contagion risk very carefully. So in answer to your question, I think you know, markets behaved um, with some volatility but with limited contagion risk. Um, but we need to be wary going ahead um, of more pronounced market volatility, specifically in the emerging market space, um, but certain events could drive more volatility and therefore the risk increases. Yes, we obviously have to come to you on the, yeah. <laughs> and the question. But, uh. So, uh, we, uh, it's true that we, as I was saying before, and uh, totally agree with my predecessor, we have uh, experiences very, very large uh, volatility. It was contained in few days, but it's true that the, the magnitude was really, really high. Now, of course, uh, there were uh, local problems in Italy forming this uh, new government and also some leakage regarding uh, some strange ideas on euros and so on that, thanks God, were cancelled pretty immediately, but of course this was uh, 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 enough to sparkle uh, a little bit of alarm in the market. However, we have the feeling that the magnitude of, of these swings cannot only be attributable to these political events in Italy, but there's also some technical issues regarding what's going on in the market in, in those last uh, years. Uh, we cannot forget that we have gone through a huge re-regulation process in the financial industry and uh, we know very well the main actors in our markets are primary dealers that uh, if you talk to each of them they tell you that their risk warehousing capacity is not the same as it used to be before the crisis and I think this is one element that has uh, for sure has emphasized the, the initial moment. 
I think there's a second technical aspect. In Italy now we have pretty developed uh, uh, future market. This market is organized in Germany, but it's, it's, a, it's a market specifically for, for BTPs, and there's, there's a contract for, for 10-year BTP and contract for 3-year BTP, and these last contract was a contract that didn't have any relevant liquidity up to a few months ago, and then this liquidity start rising. But we feel like the, the strong heat that we had on the short term part of the curve was very much linked also to the lack of resilience of this contract because a lot of dealers, when they quote on the cash market, they are linked to this uh, future contract and the lack of liquidity of future contract impacted pretty severely uh, our cash market. And this was something pretty new if compared to the past. And I also would like to add a third element, which is uh, uh, the level of rates. Let's not forget, at least for our experience, that just a few weeks ago on the short term part of the curve, we had negative rates, and we have been having negative rates for almost two years now. No more now, of course, but uh, a few, few weeks ago. Um, these long time of negative rates on the short term instrument, especially from our Treasury bills program, has brought an enormous change in the base of investors. We used to have a lot of retail and bank treasuries holding our treasury bills, which uh, really uh, it, it was no more there. I mean, looking at the data of holders of our treasury bills, we have more than 80% abroad, compared with uh, the 30% of the rest of our debt, which is abroad. So it's clear that negative level of rates change so much the composition of base of investors. And so when we enter into this volatility, uh, these new kind of investors, most of them were, we think, were also relative value players, had a total different attitude uh, with this asset class that used to have the different kind of investors they used to hold treasury bills in the past. So this was really a game changer, so why we see a lot of volatility, even at our treasury bill market, that we would never expect uh, before, even during the, the, the previous crisis in 2011. And so these I think had a very major role in uh, emphasizing the movements uh, on the market than they used to be uh, before that, that period. Okay. And, uh, uh, interesting for you, so uh, you know, it's not just Europe that's on some political risk, obviously yeah, there's talk now. of global trade war and the North Korea that has gone sort of from one extreme to the other. Um, and obviously, this is at a time of rising rates in the U.S. Um, has has the market infrastructure held up well through any um, bits of volatility? Has there been anything to concern concern you over that? Can you hear? Um, no, not frankly, not really to speak of. Um, obviously, we have increasing de issuance needs uh, going forward, which we've been uh, very uh, clear about. Uh, the market has anticipated those. Um, kind of turning back to our regular and predictable structure, we really do try to prime the market well ahead of time. We announce our debt issuance on a quarterly pattern, which is a bit different than a lot of European uh, sovereigns. Um, and within that, we, you know, we are basing our forecast for expected financing needs on administration's forecast for uh, uh, deficit uh, financing. Um, and then we kind of tailor it from quarter to quarter because those needs can definitely change and have fairly large swings from time to time. Um, but overall, we've seen very robust demand at our auctions. Uh, we've seen no deterioration in any of our auction statistics. Um, we've seen no deterioration at all in market liquidity, uh, both in terms of volumes or you know, widening out bid ask spreads or anything uh, of that, that nature yet. Um, so, uh, so we really haven't had any concerns uh, so far to date. Okay, um, so I was going to turn to the end of PSPP, um, which obviously doesn't affect the US, but I'm, I mean, maybe before we turn to P the end of PSPP, have, have you got any advice for what to do when, when QE stops? Um. Talk to your central bank. I <laughs> know, <laughs> uh, that's just to say, obviously, uh, you know, the Fed, Federal Reserve has been very public um, and went very public about how it, was, how it has begun to wind down its balance sheet. Uh, on the Treasury side as well as the MBS side, um, which allowed us at the Treasury Department to be able to kind of build one, build those numbers in in terms of uh, the additional amounts we would have to be absorbing on the marketable debt issuance side uh, as the Fed was reinvesting less Treasuries uh, as things were maturing, but also the public is aware of all of those numbers as well. And the Fed has been very clear about its messaging, which has uh, given us an advantage in terms of being clear about how we were going to uh, you know, pick up, take on the, the additional issuance uh, that we're going to need. Um, 
it is, uh, you know, right now the Fed is projected out through uh, 2020. Uh, and the needs for us that we have to pick up on the marketable side are, are sizable. Um, I think this year it's roughly in the $180 billion range and it's going to increase going out uh, in the next two years. So it's a fair amount of additional new issuance that, that we have to tack on and ask the market to absorb. So we're very cognizant of that fact. Um, but the fact that it was done very clearly transmitted publicly uh, to the market well ahead of time has really uh, allowed us to be able to, uh, to do the same as we're talking to market participants. Excellent. So, so turning to the, the Europeans, um, obviously we've got a bit of clarity um, from Mr. Draghi uh, last week, I think. Um, so the, you know, with, with the PSPP then approaching in terms of you know, the investor demand you're seeing and, or in terms of your funding strategy, are, are you changing anything about just now that we've got a bit of certainty around that? Maybe we can start with. Yeah, we, our funding strategy does not depend on the purchase program or the tapering of it, as you know. Um, when we look at the purchase program, we clearly are aware of the fact that the Bundesbank or the Euro system will continue buying German government bonds to a certain extent. Um, we expect them to buy up to 50 billion euros of our two-year, five-year, 10-year, 30-year issuance activities in 2019 in order to keep their portfolio on that particular level. And this is roughly one-third of our long-dated issuance activities overall. So there is still a significant uh, buyer in the market. Uh, we will not address that in our funding strategy. Instead, we will uh, focus on our own demand. As you know, at that stage, I tend to mumble something like that it's our interest to find a balance between planning certainty in the future, i.e. interest expenditures of the future and minimal costs as of today. You can't have both, you have to find a balance. This is still our goal and um, that is independent of the purchase program. How about you? Um, no, I mean, our, our program doesn't depend on and isn't conditioned by um, the PSPP either. Uh, we try to issue into demand and into structural flows of demand because we're a very big issuer. We can't afford to be um, excessively opportunistic uh, about this. We need to be regular and predictable um, and more so as we become a, a big treasury um, for, for, for a considerable period of time. Um, as, as Tamo said, the, 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 the end of the purchase program does not mean the end of uh, um, Bank of Spain buying bonds, they will still reinvest and this will still be a significant amount. You, you only need to, to, to find out who's going to be the marginal investor, who, who is going to uh, invest the amounts that the ECB or the, the, the Euro system stops buying. Uh, and for us, we're pretty clear about that. It's, uh, as our rating improves, the floodgates open uh, for, for certain other uh, institutional uh, investors from a wider uh, regional background as before uh, and an average improvement in the, in the average quality of our investor base. So this is a benign scenario and it comes not a minute too soon. Uh, so we, uh, we, we, we are grateful for that. Uh, we, we, we listen to our primary dealers uh, as to what to issue. Uh, so far it's in, involved a lot of long end issuance. Uh, uh, we don't have as long a, an average life as, as Portugal has, but it's, we have more debt, so it's a more difficult ship to steer. Uh, it's uh, seven and a half years now. Um, there's nothing magical about a particular number, but uh, we feel comfortable with what we've done so far. Uh, and as this transition happens, which is the PSPP bows out of the market and others pour in, uh, we'll see where demand is. Uh, and we can afford to be very pragmatic uh, about it. Not, not opportunistic, but uh, pragmatic, because we have regular predictable programs. Um, we don't do a lot of private placements, for example. Uh, we have an alternative issuance program called, you know, which is the linkers, but we aspire to be as regular and predictable as possible with that. Um, we won't issue 
if there's bouts of volatility, for example, in this program. But the market can still predict a, a certain amount of, of, our, of our moves. And this is the way we're comfortable um, right now, because we're, we're growing into uh, a, a more established, big treasury, a um, little bit like, uh, like many of our peers. And Christina, yeah, I just wanted if you could answer as well, just, um, you mentioned that you, pre you started pre-funding for next year. Is, is that always going to be the strategy going forward? To uh, well, this, is being, uh, this is a strategy that we kind of uh, inaugurated when Portugal uh, exited the, the program. We thought it uh, would be sensible to run a, a comfortable cash buffer in order to, uh, to be able to uh, better time uh, coming to the market. Um, and it, this is a, has been a strategy that has, has served as well so far. Um, one thing that uh, being predictable and regular is also something that we have been committed to, to do. Uh, and, uh, and I think that Portugal can, can kind of uh, be used as a proxy in terms of what to expect from uh, QE tapering. In the sense that from 2006 and 2017, the ECB half the, their monthly purchases in the PGB market because the, the eyes in cap or the issuer uh, limit uh, became uh, a binding constraint. Uh, and, and during that period, uh, they, uh, the, the ECB half the, the monthly purchases. And what we saw is that given the fact that this was well telegraphed, that every market participant understood that the program would continue to be uh, executed in a smooth way and what the ECB privileged was actually a smooth implementation of the program and that is, this was also very well communicated. We could see that this transition went very smoothly actually and we didn't see that steering up the market. So uh, this was not an issue, everyone understood what was going on and, uh, and we also don't anticipate uh, this transition period that will come uh, after January when uh, the, the net purchase uh, program stops and the new uh, reinvestment uh, period kicks in. We don't anticipate um, this transition to be uh, to upset the market uh, because in, at least in our market we have seen this uh, being uh, handled very smoothly. Um, also, the fact that uh, both uh, the issuer and, and uh, the monetary authority have been quite able in, in their communication efforts and tried to be as predictable as possible, I think that also provides a good anchor in terms of expectations uh, for, for all market participants. And that has, has definitely been very helpful. And, and I think that, be, uh, that was key for the success of, uh, of our issuance and, and also the way the program has been deployed in, in, in the Portuguese market specifically. And, and David, anything to, to add on that, on the, the end of PSPP, any concerns, any changes around the funding program as a result? Um, if, okay, I will put, put in a, in a different perspective. So PSPP, uh, um, so far as of course, influenced severely uh, the level of rates when it was announced and during the first part of the program. It seems now that the, 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 the management of the uh, tapering was very well carried out, as my colleagues were saying before, by the ECB. So uh, the exiting was, and the timing of it was pretty clear already uh, in the market. So uh, we don't see much impact. We haven't seen much impact on that. Uh, if I have to consider the start of this year when ECB halved uh, the buying, we haven't seen any particular problem uh, in uh, performance of our debt. I, I'm talking about the first quarter, let's say, of the year. Then we had problems regarding our political problems internally, but uh, the halved um, the, the, the of uh, 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 buying activity from the ECB was not really felt uh, in our market, as well as it was not really felt when we entered into the political turmoil uh, ECB was still there every day, but we haven't uh, seen any practical impact on that. So, in the short time, I would say that uh, we don't, uh, we haven't felt particular problem in this announcement regarding the hand of QE, and even the announcement on Thursday uh, it, it didn't bring some support on our market because probably people were 
already pricing it, the, the announcement to QE, and they were more impressed by the monetary policy stance, the fact that level of rates will stay there up to uh, next summer, and it was probably something that was not expected in such a clear way from the ECB, and that uh, contributed to giving performance to our debt right after these, uh, uh, this announcement. In terms of liquidity, we think that uh, the PSPP uh, was managed very well. Uh, we haven't seen, honestly, particular problems of liquidity in our market. I think one of the tools that helped the ECB to smooth out their, their buying activity in a very, very good way was the securities lending program that was started not, not immediately, but uh, I guess it was in mid-2016. Uh, so they were uh, basically uh, lending bonds that were under pressure in the market, and this was a very good deterrent to avoid squeeze and things like that, and these uh, worked uh, very well. For the future, so having a little bit more longer-term perspective, uh, we are fully aware that um, the ECB will, that uh, there's quite a bunch of bonds that will uh, redeem in 2019 and 2020 that are in the portfolio of ECB. We don't know exactly, of course, but we are carrying out internal simulations. And we think that in 19 and 20, there will be much larger redemptions than 2018. So I think that these, in any case, will give uh, an indirect support uh, of our market. The other point, last point, is the recomposition of base of investors. Um, so right now, we have counted, of course, significantly on the, on the role of ECB. What can happen in the future, I think uh, one area that we, we think will enlarge quite significantly is that of uh, retail investors. In Italy, we have a long tradition of a large base of retail investors that shrunk dramatically because of the level of rates. So now it's just right above 5% of our debt. And historically, it was in the average of 12, 13, 14%. So we see a lot of room to increase for, uh, for retail investors. And the other component that should increase quite significantly is that of uh, asset manager and insurance companies. The two kind of categories that you're monitoring a lot, both on domestic side and internationally, that can bring a lot of uh, substitution effect versus uh, the, the absence of, uh, of ECB going forward. Okay. And the fan stopped. So it's very, very <laughs> nice Fine. timing. Yeah. And, and maybe we can get there from the bank. Perspective? Yeah, I think um, I've said it on this stage before, but the markets have been um, incredibly technical. Um, I think so far the great unwind um, has been handled very carefully. Um, I think specifically in the US, but I think with the, the strength of the economy and in this higher rate environment, you know, monies are still going in, so that's quite positive. I think in Europe, and again in, in the UK as well, things do have to be handled quite sensitively. Um, in most scenarios, economic growth is, is positive, which I think is helping. Um, and at the moment, I think things are pretty well flagged. And I think especially with the ECB, um, and the Bank of England, you know, obviously they have to watch very carefully this economic growth. And I think you will see the support for the marketplace gradually reduce, but it looks like it will be in an orderly fashion. Um, and, you know, dependent on the economies, you know, hopefully things will work out pretty well. Um, but there is sensitivity, you know, less so for our uh, sovereign borrowers because, you know, they're frequent users, they're very diverse investor bases. But once you get into corporate issuance and bank issuance, often a central bank has been, you know, the largest order in the book and taking a decent percentage of every specific deal with the relevant criteria. Um, as that's gradually removed, there's potentially more risk in play. But fundamentally, I think the ECB and others are so focused on the funding cost to the corporates and the SMEs, they'll watch it very closely, and matters will be reasonably orderly. And that's really the key dynamic, um, because I think the last thing any central bank will want now is a dramatic spiking in the cost of um, the issuance of corporates and SMEs, especially at this potentially sensitive juncture in the economy. Okay, excellent. Um, so we've actually got a question from the audience come in um, through the power of technology. Um, but um, before we do that, I just um, wanted to ask Clay, because um, we were talking a bit about funding mix of, and, and tenors and so on. And the, the US obviously had a, a lot of bill assurance um, earlier this year that sort of caught a lot of headlines. But sure, I sure to talk us through that. I can, I can speak to that a bit. I think sometimes um, market participants don't always quite fully understand 
um, how the U.S. Treasury uses its bill issuance. We issue across the bill curve, so we have a four-week bill, a three-month bill, a six-month bill, and a, and a one-year bill, and we just announced last month that we're going to start issuing a two-month bill uh, at some point later this year. Um, we're still kind of working out uh, when that might happen. Um, we have seen very strong demand for the short end of our curve in the bill sector, particularly from money market funds in the U.S. There was fundamental money market fund reform coming post global crisis in the Dodd-Frank legislation uh, that has driven a, a large shift uh, into treasury bills, um, which is, has been good for us. But we use bills uh, really more as a, uh, a buffer, if you will, on our shorter term financing and cash balance needs. We can sometimes have very large swings in the treasury cash balance is uh, from week to week, depending on if large payments are going out for social security, things like that, or on large inflow days on corporate tax dates and things like that. So, um, and it's difficult to manage that using coupons. So we tend to use our bills uh, to, to ladder in to meet those needs. So there are a lot of seasonal uh, increases and decreases in our bill issuance. So I know earlier this year, in the March timeframe, we had a number of factors come together that required us to, over the course of several weeks, increase, uh, increase bill issuance substantially. The market was expecting an increase. I think they got a bit more than they were anticipating. Uh, and the, the multiple factors are, one, it was March, where we are paying out most of our personal uh, tax refunds before April 15 is the big tax day that we start to get receipts in. Uh, we were also just coming off of uh, what's unique to the United States, and I hope no one else has to deal with it, uh, the debt limit issue in the United States where the amount of debt we can issue is capped, and so we were trying to work under a limit, and because of that, we had run our cash balances down much lower than we normally would. Um, the third factor is we do usually have in place um, a cash balance buffer of roughly five days of liquidity needs, uh, with a floor of 150 billion that we keep in cash balances at Treasury. Um, and sometimes that can be a much larger amount depending on what the liquidity needs are. So what happened in March was the debt limit ended, um, the suspension period, um, and we were quickly trying to both rebuild our cash balance needs and our buffer at the same time that it was a seasonally the period where we tend to have the largest bill issuance already because we have so many refunds going out. So we increased bill issuance roughly 400 billion over a few week period. Um, and uh, we've since then on a net balance brought down the bills outstanding. Um, but really I think sometimes people forget that the bill issuance, we really do use it and it swings around. Uh, we try not, across the coupons we tend to be very gradual in how we change issuance sizes, whether we're increasing or decreasing. The bills, you can see much larger swings because our cash balance needs uh, shift around uh, on a much shorter time frame uh, in a larger way, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the question from the audience, um, maybe slightly controversial, I don't know. Do you see a fiscal union in the Eurozone, and if so, in what time frame? Um, so I don't know whether we, is, is, can you say it again? Uh, do you foresee a fiscal union in the Eurozone, and if so, in what time frame? Uh, this is it's more probably for, for politician a question. Um, uh, let's say it's, uh, this is something that we need to, to go towards, that should be the end. I don't think it's, it's still a bumpy road ahead of us for, for that. But for example, I think that uh, if uh, we managed to complete the banking union would already be a very big step forward. It's not directly related to fiscal union, but of course it would be a big piece of the mosaic that would help to get into fiscal union. Uh, I think should be the goal of our politician for the next few years is something that we should have clear in our mind, but I don't think it's something that will happen very, very shortly. Okay. Anyone else want to come in on the fiscal union? It's a great question. Great question, great answer. I think we have a lot of subjects here in the European Union and in the Euro area. And um, I think we will predominantly focus on from a political side in emphasizing the advantages which we have given the currency union, given the, um, the, the economic union. 
And this is a good subject and a good task. And I think if we are more successful in that, then we have gained already a lot of stability and a lot of future going forward. And then we have addressed that. Then we may come back to that interesting question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, baby steps, I would say. Uh, fiscal, fiscal union in this hypothetical further integration is, is, is several steps before what, what, what can uh, be taken now. I mean, we, we need to advance in um, banking union, and, and we need a little more integration uh, at the macroeconomic level. We need a, a, a more, more discipline um, in terms of the, um, the, the European semester, et cetera. And then, and then fiscal union, however you define it, uh, yeah. will be the, 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 the natural and technical consequence of all that. So it'll be a relatively simple decision to be made at the very political level, but once these baby steps are achieved. Um, and I see those much closer than fiscal union. Mm. Uh, but so has the entire European project. I mean, this was born with a view to, you know, to, to, to create a, um, those three words, uh, ever closer union. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's 70 years on and we're still, we're still at it. Um, it's, a, it's a worthwhile project, but the speed may differ. Uh, fiscal union is the eventual, I think, um, end game, uh, which can happen um, years from now. Uh, but so far, let's, let's focus on what we have to focus on, which is banking union, capital markets union, all these things that are on the table. Christina, you can talk. One of the things, uh, when, before, when we were discussing political risk and, uh, and, and contagion, uh, one of the, not only the toolkit, as I mentioned, uh, is, uh, is a better one than, uh, so a lot has, uh, has progressed. And we also see that, the set of rules, um, and that uh, 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 to, uh, to which uh, all European countries need to abide by, uh, is no, now uh, also much stronger than, than in the past. And I think that these are uh, 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 a broad consensus around the need to, uh, to comply with those rules. So, so I think these, these days every European country is aware that the, uh, the rule book is there and, uh, and everyone has to, f to follow it. Um, and so I think naturally we will evolve from, from these uh, state of the art uh, situation, and we'll naturally evolve. Uh, and and um, the, the 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 fiscal union will come, will come when uh, all the all the steps that lead to that will be concluded. And so, in, in between now and that kind of final hurdle or or final objective. A number of steps need to be taken, and a number of decisions need also to be made. And and in, and, and what we need to, to 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 guarantee is that this process is a very solid one, and that everyone is on board on that. Which sometimes it will be difficult, um, and sometimes people will not take take that willingly. Uh, but uh, if we believe that European project has a future. That will be that should be our, our our aim, but in the meantime, what we need is to work intensively in order to complete what actually is currently on the table, and and for for us to be successful in uh, in in closing or, or in tying up all the all the loose ends that uh, are currently uh, that are, are still are kind of uh, that they still exist. We need to kind of. Uh, tied up all the nets or, or all, all, all the loose ends in order to, uh, to take the, the next step in a very uh, uh, solid, solid way. We need to, to, to know very well uh, the, the path we are, we are treading on. Okay, perfect. And thanks for whoever um, sent that question in as well. Um, so the, um, the next question there, um, we had uh, about whether banks are fully committed um, to the primary dealer model. Um, this is something that rears its head now and then when a, when a bank pulls out a primary, um, a primary dealership. Um, um, maybe, you know, maybe start with, with Martin from the, the yeah. bank side and 
Do you see the Premier in their model? No, it's, it's, it's always a hot topic, and I'm sure for many of our uh, primary uh, uh, funding officials, it's, it's you know, one of the biggest challenges they face, because I think the role of uh, primary dealers is, is incredibly critical. Um, I think sometimes, perhaps, it is looked at too harshly in terms of the economics. And we've seen institutions go in and out of some primary dealerships, and a lot of it is because of perhaps regulation and changes in their ability to sort of warehouse risk, but perhaps the fundamental um, lack of profitability in some scenarios from running a primary dealership. Um, I said it last year, I said it the year before, and I'll say it again, it is about clients. Um, for us as a bank, uh, our primary dealerships are uber critical. Um, it is definitely helping fund the economy and it's also helping investors and again we've seen this of late with more market volatility, mm. the criticality at the end of the day of, of key investors but also smaller investors um, in the process. So um, it is disconcerting and I think the vast majority of, of notable primary dealerships have reduced um, over the last handful of years. But it is a client business, it is a relationship business, and it is fundamentally about um, developing the economy. Um, I think our industry has done a bad job with um, short-term views. And again, in the current environment, we have to be quite careful because you know, everything is really around you know, the cost and efficiency of running your business. But I think for those that are consistent in terms of primary dealership, there are many benefits and not just linked to you know, general activity with a specific PD, but ancillary business, which I think every bank sort of you know, really pitches for aggressively, whether it's syndicated deals, derivatives, foreign exchange, whatever. But also for the greater good of the markets, we need liquid government bonds. And if we start to see more constraint, that's a bad thing. So I would ask all of our um, senior funding officials to embrace their primary dealers, which I think they all do, um, but also vice versa, and perhaps there is too much short-termism rather than a long-term view. Okay, does anyone... Uh, anyone? Um, from uh, from issue perspective, I think that uh, we may consider primary dealership programs not ideal ones, but at least is, they are the best we, uh, we have currently, uh, and I think we should consider them as kind of working in progress. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that is evolving, and it's evolving as also markets develop. And I think that uh, we still, it's, just, it's still working. And we sometimes even, they need a bit of uh, some tweaking, but um, working progress. Uh, how teamwork and, uh, and also, <laughs> it is also teamwork. And, and, and given the, so the recent bouts of volatility, were, were all the issuers here happy with you know, how the primary dealer system worked at that time? Um, we, yes, at the, the very worst point of the volatility um, with, with, with Italy and Spain at the same time, uh, a minimum of seven primary dealers were providing quotes on the screens uh, with, with smaller amounts on either end of the bid offer and um, much, much wider bid offer spreads. But that's, that's the point. Liquidity was thinner but never quite disappeared. Um, and and th this, th this, this is a tribute to the primary dealership um, system. They provide a service, uh, and the economics of that service has to have, have to work uh, on, on both sides, right? They, they, they don't have to have huge profits, but at the same time, they still have to be incentivized to be there because it's the very best system that we know of. Um, and not just because of the commitment of their balance sheet, but the, the price discovery element uh, of the primary dealership model is the best one there is uh, available and that I know of, and my, um, um, my, my institution is a firm defender of the primary dealership system. Okay. Um, David, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I totally agree with uh, uh, the, my colleagues of, regarding the, the crucial role uh, played by primary dealers, even in this, in this recent crisis. Uh, we had more or less the same experience, so we did not have let's say, a core group of dealers that were keeping the prices even in a very, very uh, difficult situation. However, I, I would uh, stress a fact that's been also underlined before that 
uh, in these years, uh, regulations have ch changed uh, dramatically, so it's clear that uh, the, the risk of browsing capacity has shrunk quite, quite significantly, and this is manifest when we, we see these, uh, uh, these big uh, uh, lack, sudden lack of liquidity that, thanks God, are temporary, very limited, uh, but they're there. Now, there's, I would say, starting from 2014, we have now several clear examples, not only in Europe, also some, sometimes also in the U.S. market, of uh, some liquidity problem. It probably concern all the asset classes, not just, not just government bonds. It's a global issue. But I think from our perspective, we have also, we are always in search of, uh, let's say, uh, the better liquidity as possible, taking into consideration all these new constraints. And of course, I think something we discuss a lot also in Brussels among uh, DMOs, whether there are new models that can just improve the current primary dealership model. So without, without putting it in discussion, we understand whether there are some other changing in the, in the regulation of the market that they can help having more liquidity that we have now. I would say having more liquidity in stress times, because in, in, uh, in, in ordinary times, I think liquidity is pretty satisfactory. I mean, now market is pretty happy about liquidity, but the, the big topic there is what happens in turbulent times. It seems like there's less resilience that we used to have, and so I think we have to be very, say, uh, open mind to, 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 to take all this, this issue and see if there are alternatives. But I, I agree with uh, Christina, it's, it's really an open, uh, it's a work in progress on that. I understand, actually, and you said some very good things there, Debbie, but I tell you what, there, during uh, the, the worst time of the Italian volatility, um, I think Pablo made the point, bid offer spreads widened out a lot, but there was still a marketplace. Um, but again, it was, as I said earlier, a reminder that markets don't necessarily go in one direction. Yeah. And I think longer term, we all need to build the resilience of the marketplace in more volatile times, because as I'm sure um, we all recognised, um, when the market is super volatile, um, frame it in this current regulatory environment, you know, banks have less balance sheet to commit. Exactly. You also have the dynamic of domestic banks versus international banks and the true breadth of your primary dealership. And I think the challenge often there is investors often, when times are brutally volatile, they will go to the domestic banks because they seem to be the biggest banks, you know, could be holdings of risk, whatever. And so we need to really, as an industry, I think, combine, work harder to sort of reinforce the resilience of the market in more volatile times because, you know, there were some pretty sharp movements, especially at the short end, which we haven't really seen for quite some time. And getting this PD market, the government funding market, and then, of course, the follow markets to be more resilient has to be a critical aim. Okay, perfect. So I'm rather conscious that the timer has run out. Um, so unless, just from player time, any final point in... Primary dealership model at all? Or? Um, just really quickly, um, uh, we very much rely on our primary dealers in a, in a lot of facets. are very committed to the primary dealer model. We have 23 uh, in the U.S., and they are required in the U.S. to bid a pro rata share at every auction, so they help us ensure that we have auctions that are covered. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, they still represent, uh, you know, roughly in our trading values in the secondary market, about half is over IDBs and half outside off, off of platforms. Um, and uh, some of the data that we have shows that the dealer space outside of the platforms is still about 50% of the trading volume on a daily basis is, is the dealer. So, uh, so it, the model has worked very well for the United States over the years. Uh, and so we are very committed to it. Um, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, from our perspective, we're not anticipating making changes to that. Perfect. Well, if you could thank my panel. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the end of the day. So, thank, thank you. you.